Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's behind the scenes video, we will be looking at everything we know about the makeup effects in Waterworld. So without further ado, let's layer up that spray tan and jump right into it. The task of rendering the makeup effects for Waterworld fell upon makeup supervisor Frank Perez and assistant makeup supervisor Jim McCoy, along with an army of other professional artists. Their mission was to establish, through makeup, the same lived-in universe that had been painstakingly created by the costume and set designers. The makeup supervisors worked with director Kevin Reynolds to develop the look of each faction in Waterworld. It was decided that the Atollers would appear weathered and tanned to reflect their existence on the open ocean. The smokers would appear greasy and grimy to reflect their existence as motorheads living aboard the ruins of the Exxon Valdez. The sheer number of actors and extras in many of the scenes in Waterworld presented one of the greatest challenges for the makeup artists working on the film. Makeup artists Jean Van Fouy and Fred Blau Jr. oversaw the makeup applications for the crowds of atollers and smokers. For the atollers, full body makeup was required and an assembly line process was devised to efficiently get each stunt person and extra ready for being on camera. And so, a three-sided wooden spray booth was set up next to Kauai Harbor. According to Frank Blau, quote, We put the makeup in a regular spray gun, hooked up the air compressors, and sprayed everybody down. The water-based pancake makeup was tinted with the appropriate sun-baked tones. The smokers underwent a similar process, but with a darker brown makeup and then smudged with grease. After getting sprayed down, extras and stun people then went on to a large shed for touch-up details to help model out the flat look of the spray tans. The on-screen talent would then get into their wardrobes and report to the hairstyling department, headed up by L. Elliot, to have their hair teased and snarled to reflect the post-apocalyptic style. The makeup for the stunt people in Waterworld presented an additional challenge. Makeup needed to be waterproof so they would not rinse off after multiple takes splashing in and out of the water. Fred Blau came up with a formula that used a type of ink similar to the kind used in movie tattoos that combined with an alcohol base. When the alcohol dried, the pigment adhered. This formula too was sprayed on and different colors were concocted for waterproof cut and bruise effects. The formula, made specifically for the production of Waterworld, was a success, and Blau ended up making about 10 gallons every week during principal filming. On a typical day of production, 16 makeup artists would spend at least two hours preparing over 100 extras for the day's work. After a day of filming, the stunt people and extras would report to rustic showers on the harbor docks to clean up with soap, shampoo, and solvent. Like with applying the makeup, an assembly line approach was used for removing the makeup. The waterproof makeup required a special formula to dissolve the ink. Performers wearing the waterproof makeup were sprayed down with an oil-based solvent that broke up the pigment without even much scrubbing. The stunt people simply showered afterwards and went home. As for the main actors in the film, makeup application was at times a much more involved process. Frank Perez and his crew needed to apply prosthetic makeup to truly transform the characters. Legendary makeup artists Tom and Barry Berman were called upon for these more specialized applications. At the end of the Atoll battle, the smoker refueler barge explodes, causing the Deacon to lose his eye. The Bermans created three different prosthetics to show the varied progression of the Deacon's wound. For the scene in which the doc attempts to replace the missing eye with a painted ball bearing, a special device was created that allowed the eye to fly out when Dennis Hopper turned his head. The prosthetic took about an hour and a half to apply, so it was decided that the Deacon would wear an eye patch for the majority of the film, which also helped fit his pirate persona. Fred Blau also placed stitching on Hopper's brow to help better sell the effect. And while I believe the gore effects applied to Dennis Hopper's face are totally top-notch, I think it's worth noting that some of the other gore makeup in the film is not so effective, namely the blood smear on the back of the depraved drifter, played by Kim Coates, which is implied to be a fatal wound. 
and perhaps it was hastily done due to time constraints or shooting on the open ocean, but it may have also been toned down for fear of being overly gruesome for the film's PG-13 rating. There's also this image of a bloody Nord emerging from the crashed Deacon Mobile that was also cut from the film perhaps for the same reasons. As for the Mariner, prosthetic effects were necessary to transform Kevin Costner into an aquatic muto with gills and webbed feet. The Mariner's feet were sculpted and cast by Tom Berman to fit precisely around Costner's feet. Soft spreaders held his toes apart so that a thin membrane of latex could be applied over top to create the webbing. Each foot took approximately 40 minutes to apply, and unfortunately the prosthetics were extremely fragile and the effect would be destroyed if Costner even took a few steps. Michael McAllister and his team of effects artists used digital paint tools to help polish out the damage inflicted on the webbed feet. As a result of the long application process and the fragile nature of the webbed feet, Costner mostly went barefoot with moleskin padding to protect the bottoms of his feet, leaving us with many shots that accidentally catch his true feet and frame. The application of the Mariner's gills took around 40 minutes to apply behind each ear as well. For the initial reveal of the gills, digital touch-up was also required due to the prosthetics unintentionally looking too much like female genitalia. According to McAllister, the first shot of the gills looked quote, bright red and kinda rude. To avoid any unwanted audience giggling, digital artists at Cinesite changed their shape and desaturated the bright color. Later in the film, after the Trimarine has been torched by the smokers and Enola kidnapped, the Mariner and Helen dive underwater to avoid the lethal bullets of the smoker army. The Mariner uses his gills to breathe for him and Helen underwater. No actual prosthetic effects were used during the underwater shoot, so this too was a digitally created effect. McAllister and his team rotoscoped out the initial shot of the gills being pulled back by the atoller and played the opening motion back and forth to create a pulsating effect as if water were being pushed through. Using motion tracking and blending techniques, the clip was painted into the underwater shots of the Mariner and Helen by a flame VFX artist, and I actually believe that this digital effect is astonishingly well pulled off and totally holds up to modern VFX standards. Also in this scene, as well as the one with the Mariner teaching Enol how to swim, Costner wore swimming flippers to help with his performance while in the water. In a few shots, the flippers came into frame, so the VFX artist at Cinesite rotoscoped them out and composited in the webbed feet, blending them with bubbles from another shot. Apart from the specialized prosthetic makeup, Frank Perez, who served as Costner's personal makeup artist on many films, applied his daily on-camera makeup, a process that only took around 20 minutes. One other notable makeup effect in the film is of course Enola's mysterious tattoo, the map to dry land. I actually have already covered this makeup effect in my video specifically on Enola's tattoo, so I'll only briefly hit on it here. Once the design of the tattoo was finalized by director Kevin Reynolds and illustrator Stefan Deschamps, a silkscreen was created by Fred Blau, who was actually an accomplished cinematic tattoo expert at the time, having worked on The Illustrated Man in 1969 and Tattoo in 1981. He used the silkscreen to create hundreds of newspaper stencils, which were transferred onto Tina Majorino's back with alcohol, not unsimilar to how temporary tattoos from a Cracker Jack box are applied. And of course, I can't end this video without addressing the long-standing rumor that Kevin Costner had the VFX team digitally hide his receding hairline, a rumor that was first reported on by Newsweek in 1995 and perpetuated online over the years through places like IMDB Trivia, which should never be fully trusted. After the rumor was printed, Costner dismissed the claim in several publications including Starlog Magazine and CNN Showbiz News, saying, quote, The computer generated hair. And I was so surprised it came from Newsweek. No matter if they cite a source, it's just bullshit, and they are bullshit printing it. 
And I have to say, I've never found any evidence to back the rumor, nor have I picked out any shots in the film that look like they've digitally altered Costner's hairline, so I think it's safe to say this was a complete fabrication by Newsweek to drum up more unfounded controversy about the production of Waterworld. And well, there you have it. That is everything we know about the makeup effects in Waterworld. If you enjoyed this deep dive, please consider giving it a thumbs up or leaving a comment below. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. We have an ever-growing library of videos and playlists and many more planned for the future. Also, follow the Atoll on Instagram for even more Waterworld content or to reach out to me personally. Link in the description below. But with that, thanks as always, for joining me at The Atoll.